In this video I'm going to explain how to use a combination of PostGIS databases and QGIS to handle time varying uh, data in a geographical information systems by the help of the Time Manager plugin. So it's about geospatial temporal data management and the data we will use is from the German Weather Service DWD Deutscher Wetterdienst because uh, they provide a dense network of environmental measuring systems, weather stations, uh, in particular precipitation measurements. And um, so the information of the stations and the information of the time series, so the, the, the precipitation recording at these stations is bundled and uh, provided in an FTP archive online in an open data archive provided by the DWD. So the, the software I'm using is available in a Git repository, in my Git repository OpenGeo, so it's on uh, github.com, wolfbecker slash OpenGeo. And the activities, so the software I'm today presenting is uh, mainly related to the activity or the folder Geo930. And the full name is Geo930 PostgreSQL Insert DWD Precipitation Time Series and Stations. So the pre prerequisites, uh, so I assume that uh, you have Python 3 and JupyterLab installed. I'm using the Anaconda distribution. And we use a lot of uh, powerful uh, Python packages such as Pandas, GeoPandas, and also SQL Alchemy uh, to connect to the Postgres database. And you, sh you also have to have a PostgreSQL database installed together with the PostGIS extension. And it's highly recommended to also use the PG Admin for uh, management uh, graphical user interface to manage Postgres databases and I'm using QGIS 3.10 together with the Time Manager plugin to produce in the end a video of precipitations. So the idea is that to feed a geospatial database with DWD station information as well as the time series data recorded at these stations. So then we join the time series data, which is time varying, with the station location data, which is static, inside the database and we create a so-called view from it. It's a relation which we can use later. So we use this view in QGIS and we create a series of time-dependent maps in QGIS a kind of movie by means of the Time Manager plugin. And this approach combines spatial information, that of the stations, and the precipitation at the stations with time, right? The measurement at a particular time. So it's a combination of geodata and temporal data, or geospatial data and temporal data, and therefore the title of geo spatial, spatial, temporal t data management. So the open source tools we are using is PostgreSQL, that's an object relational database management system, a very powerful one. Um, PostGIS is a spatial extension for PostgreSQL and that basically utilizes this uh, object relational nature of PostgreSQL because that allows you to define or to, yeah, to create your own data types, complex data types in the database management system together with functions on these new data types. And uh, so PostGIS provides new geometric data types and uh, functions on geometry, so functions which operate on the new data types. QGIS is a, is a very nice open source uh, geographical information system um, and uh, QGIS uh, can use a live data connection um, to layers which are stored in PostGIS. So the idea is that we store geometric, geographical data with, with 
some geometry information, a point of a station with coordinates in the PostGIS database. And this information can then be used as a vector layer, as a spatial layer in QGIS. It can be imported, but it's a live link. So any change in the database will be reflected immediately in real time in QGIS and vice, vice versa. So, and then we also not just store the geometry information of the station, but also the associated time series, which is a different kind of data. It does not have a location by itself, by it, it doesn't provide a geometry, right? You usually just have the station identifier, a station number or so, and the time series varying over time. And so now we can combine to these two informations, information sources in the database, in the PostGIS database, and create a new view on the data. And this view is then used in QGIS, and we will process the data by means of the Time Manager plugin to produce time varying maps. So the Time Manager plugin for QGIS basically selects features from the attribute table of a layer you have uh, where the time of these features, the feature have a time coordinate, where the time of the features matches a reference time which you can which is predefined or given by the time manager plugin. So the time manager plugin produces a reference time and then from all the features you have in the long attribute table, only those are selected where the timestamp of the feature in the attribute table matches the timestamp which is given by the time manager. So that's the trick. And uh, of course, we use Python, Pandas, and GeoPandas a lot uh, to yeah, extract the data from the DWD archive to download the data and to, to process the data. Okay, so the, the example data we are using is from the German Weather Service, DWD. And uh, so we would like to use uh, recent hourly precipitation data. So it's the way the DWD organizes the data. So we say recent data is relatively new, it's 500 it covers a range of the last 500 days in hourly resolution and we are interested in the precipitation because that's a nice feature. Uh, you, you, if you produce videos later on, you can see really fronts uh, moving over the federal state of Nordrhein-Westfalen, for example. And we want to limit the analysis to Nordrhein-Westfalen because uh, uh, just to limit the amount of data we have to handle. Right, but it's not limit. Of course, you could also change and uh, choose another region. So, and the DWD open uh, data source for this activity now is then uh, opendata.dwd.de, and then we have climate environment, the climate data center, observations Germany, climate hourly precipitation recent. So, how does the, this archive look like? So, if we go to this archive. you see that um, that you have a long list of files here and what is in the f in this uh, folder is described basically in the name or in the in the directory tree right you see it, it's related, so C, CDC is the climate data center of the DWD responsible for the large measurement network of the weather stations of the German Weather Service. So observations Germany, the data is related to climate, hourly resolution of precipitation, and we are using the recent data set, that means we cover the last 500 days, uh, and not historic data. So if you want to go back to 2017 or so, you would have to use historical here instead of recent. So then um, we have a bunch of zip archives here, which in fact contain the, um, the precipitation time series 
for a given station and the station is identified by its station ID or station number and that's the number which is also given here in the file name. Um, and uh, very important is this description file which describes the, uh, the stations of uh, where, the, where the measurements um, are taken. And in German it's called RR, Stundenwerte, Beschreibung, Stationen, Text. So RR, I assume that this stands for kind of rain rate, for example, Regenrate. Stundenwerte is hourly values, Desk Beschreibung is description, stations is Stationen. So when you open this file, you see that this is a long list of available stations where hourly precipitation is measured, right? And you have a lot of, let's say this is a kind of almost a fixed width formatted file, but you see because as you can see here, uh, the fields which we have in one row, um, yeah, have a fixed width, right? They are nicely aligned vertically. So they really build columns, but here in the first two rows, you see uh, that the, that this um, yeah, format is basically violated. So here it's different. So you have to treat uh, the first row uh, separately from the, from the data row if you read the data uh, yeah, automatically in Python. So if you, if you de 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 yeah, develop your Python script, you have to take this into account. So, and then the different fields we have is the first column here provides the station ID. The second column uh, provides a date since when uh, the hourly precipitation measurements uh, are provided. And the, the, the third column here, it's bis datum, means date two, is the last available date of the hourly measurements for that particular station. And here you see today is the 11th of February 2021. You see that this station number 20 seems to be, seems to be still active, whereas this one here has been uh, stopped in 2011. And uh, so this is something you have to take into account, maybe here even, right? This, this, this number, station number has been abandoned in 2008. So the, there is no um, hourly precipitation available, a recent hourly precipitation available. So then the station height, here's the altitude of the, of the measurement station. Uh, then we have the, um, the latitude and the longitude. So this is the northern latitude and the eastern, uh, the eastern uh, longitude. Uh, the, the, the station name. So the coordinate system here is WGS84. Um, so this is in degree northern latitude and uh, uh, in this case here it is uh, eastern um, uh, longitude. Um, then the name of the station and the federal state in which the station is located. So, and now our task is to filter, so first of all, to, to read this file automatically and to format it in a way so that we can digest it in Python. And we will use pandas to do that. And then we will filter uh, only the, the stations which are still active and which are in Northern Westfalen, situated in Northern Westfalen. So then we have this, um, um, the yeah the station information uh, together with the geometrical information here and there are several ways how to import this file to a geographical information system or to a geodatabase and I will show you how to use um, the geopandas package to convert this data into a ge yeah, geometry enabled information. So we will convert lat latitude and longitude uh, to a data type, which is a point data type, which can then be used immediately in PostGIS and or in QGIS. 
Good. So that means this station here is the this this file basically provides the meta information and the dis and the distribution of the different stations in Nordrhein in, in in Germany, and we filter out only the ones from Nordrhein Westfalen and the ones which are still active. Okay. So, but how does the the data itself look like? So the 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 precipit the um, let's let's select one station for example. Let's search for Carla Aston. Carla Aston, that's a station which is uh, the highest in, in Northern Westfalen with 839 meters. It's a, uh, it's a, it, it's a small mountain in, in, in a hilly region called Sauerland. It's southeast, uh, uh, in the southeast of uh, Northern Westfalen. You see it is still active. It's a very important station. Uh, for the DWD in uh, in Germany, not on Westfalen at least, and uh, so that has that has the station number two four eight three. So let's have a look at the time series at the measurements provided at uh, station two four eight three. So therefore, we have to search for the zip file two four eight three. So. Let me download this. Okay, let's go there. So now what we are doing now manually is something you have to do automatically in uh, with Python, right? So we have to download, we have to identify the right uh, stations for Northern Westfalen. We have to download the, the, the zip files. We have to unzip the files, the archive, the zip archive. And uh, then we have to identify the right file provides. You see here a lot of files, most mostly metadata. So additional data on the devices which are used to to do the measurements and on the on the station name which might have changed over time and then you find this product rr stunde which means it's a that's really providing the product right the product of rain rate in hourly uh, resolution so let's open that and have a look and here again you see the stations id it's in german so mess datum uh, QN underscore eight R one uh, RS underscore int WRTR and EOR and what um, what these um, columns here mean is described in the metadata in the here in the uh, either in in the in the folder. Uh, in the archive of the DWD or in the zip archives here, right? And um, so the information we need is, so the actual precipitation measurement is this column here with the column header R1. So that is the, uh, sorry, I have a, Ah, yeah. Okay, so this uh, R1 here is, is uh, the, uh, the precipitation rate per hour. So the, um, the millimeters, so the, the, see, the, the, the rain, the amount of rain in units millimeters in one hour. So that's what we call a precipitation rate, a volume per time. So, and then we have to extract this information from that file. Okay. Good. And that has to be done for all the stations which are in Nordrhein Westfalen and which are still active. And we do this, we will provide this, uh, or we, we will do this in a, in a Jupyter notebook, which I provide in, my, in, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in the Git repository. Okay, so, and these information now 
these information this information has to be uploaded to the PostGIS database and we we use geopandas to produce a geometry enabled layer so it, a geograph a geographic layer of the stations and we provide this layer in the post GIS database and from the time series we create another table which then holds all the time series one after the other so you will have the the station ID and the timestamp the measurement time right together with uh, the uh, this this is the the key the primary key of the time uh, series table the precipitation time series table I give you the station ID and the time and then you know uh, which actual measurement value you have to select right so you need these two information so time so station ID and and a timestamp and then you have all this information so you have one uh, one time series in the table so the first time series let's say of the first station and then you add you append the second time series of the second uh, station to it under it so to say and then you have a very very long table with all the hourly uh, precipitation measurements for for all the stations in Nordrhein Westfalen in the given time period which is 500 days because we are using this recent data set okay so and to but before we can upload the data to the database we have to create the database and uh, so this is the first activity we will have to do the first step is basically we create the post GIS database geo with the owner geo master then we insert the DWD station information uh, via geopandas into the database right so then we have the layer of all the stations with the name and the coordinates and the altitudes and what have you and the station ID of course then we insert the DWD time series via pandas into the database this does not provide a geometric information it does not have a coordinate right each time series is identified by the station ID and by the time so that means we have to to yeah we have to associate the time series with the associated station to get the location where this time series is measured so we create for that we create a view to join the station information with location and the time series with timestamp and this view is then used in QGIS to feed the time manager which can then be used to create this set or the sequence of time dependent maps showing the spatial distribution of precipitation for a given hour right and then you change the time and you produce a new map and that shows you then the new distribution of the precipitation for that particular timestamp and then you take the next time step the next time the next hour the next hour the next hour and so on and then you would generate a sequence of maps which you then can export as for example PNG files and to produce a movie externally from the individual files so in detail as so this is now related to the database creation so we first of all create a user geomaster then we create a database named geo and we make the geomaster the owner that means geomaster becomes the owner of the database geo right the postgres user account is the administrative user account with maximum rights on your server right and you don't want to use this for a production uh, 
database to interact with, um, yeah, to create data and so on, um, because uh, this is too too risky, right? You should always try to reduce, um, um, let's say, the the privileges of a user as much as you can. Uh, to interact with the data in a database. Otherwise, you're risking to, to compromise the data to, to, or the database even. Okay, so GeoMaster is already relatively powerful and has a lot of privileges. In And is, in fact, it, um, the GeoMaster is the owner, will become the owner of the database Geo. And when we have the database and its owner, we will create the extension PostGIS and that also has to be done as Postgres, as the user Postgres. So you need uh, to be yeah, a master or an administrator um, to create this extension in the database. Then we change the database. And as user Postgres, we connect to the database Geo. And within this database Geo, we will create the schema DWD. A schema is basically a subset of tables, a kind of namespace in the database, and that helps you to, to keep your, yeah, your tables and views tidy. Right? You, can, you, could, you can assign the tables to a certain name, call it a topic or so, right? To is, and that, then the, the, the term, the technical term for it is a schema. You will see later on how this works. And uh, GeoMaster then becomes responsible for this uh, schema DWD. Okay, that means we have now a user GeoMaster who owns the database Geo. The database Geo exists and it is a PostGIS database. And within this database, we create another namespace DWD to store all the DWD related information in one yeah, a kind of folder, you can say. OK, and then the user GeoMaster comes into play. And uh, this one, so this is now finished, right? And all the rest is done just by GeoMaster. And uh, so this, this GeoMaster will create the tables and the views with, uh, within the DWD data. Um, it uh, will import the data um, and provide, uh, yeah, provide access to the data and so on. And we will then use uh, Python and GeoPandas and use the credentials of the GeoMaster to upload the DWD station information. And we also use Python Pandas to upload the time series as used the user GeoMaster. So these steps you have to, have to be performed just once. And for the rest of, of the, the life of the database, you would basically just uh, interact with the database as user GeoMaster. OK, so then let's get started with this activity. So I opened, uh, so I cloned the repository. And uh, I now opened the Jupyter no and I started Jupyter Lab, and I opened uh, the Jupyter Notebook Geo 0930 DWD and so on. But before we start, let's have a look at um, my local PostgreSQL database server. You see here that this is this is my uh, local PostgreSQL installation. I also have some remote installations on servers in the internet. But um, this activity will be done on a, on a, on a local Postgres uh, database. And the only database I currently have is the database called Postgres. And this I just use as a maintenance database, which means to create a new database in Postgres QL in the database management system. I have to connect as user Postgres to somewhere, to a database. And the default database in this case is Postgres. So I in the beginning, I, create, I, I connect as the user Postgres to the database Postgres in order to be able 
to create, for example, new users, new databases, and so on, to do maintenance. Therefore, this database is also called the maintenance database. I'm just using it for maintenance purposes, and I don't use it for, let's say, real, real life data interaction or something, right? So, and uh, so that means I can now connect to uh, the local database server as user Postgres to the database Postgres, and then I can create the user geo master and the new database geo. And uh, so I summarized all the activities here in a, a set of SQL. Uh, files which you can also which are also f in the uh, in the repository so if you go to open geo to my open geo uh, repository under geo 0930 uh, you will see um, uh, uh, so I, f I forgot to push at this point, but uh, here you will you will you will see also the the SQL uh, files uh, I'm I'm now using to 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 do all the database related uh, actions. Good. So I will push this later so that uh, the SQL uh, files are available. Okay. So let's have a look at the first file. The first file is named, so um, it, it carries the number 10, create database, geo, and create the roles which are necessary, right? And uh, here is a short readme. So we have to execute this file by executing basically psql, that's the command line interface to the Postgres database, with minus u is the user, Postgres, minus d, the database, Postgres, and minus f is the file which I, which we want to execute, and that's uh, 0, 1, 0, it's basically this file here. So we pass this file to the psql command line interface, which then executes all the commands we have here. You could also type them basically interactively. Um, you can also create the database uh, by means of the pgadmin, but it's highly recommended to use SQL scripts um, also for your own documentation. So you can redo the work easily. You can see in, in, in one place uh, what you have done, which databases are created, which roles are created, which privileges these roles have, and so on. So before we... so. We, will, we want to create the database geo, right? And with owner geo master, but that requires that the geo master already exists. Uh, therefore, the first action is that we create the role geo master with login, which means it is a user which can log in to the database, but it's no super user, which means it, does, it doesn't have as much power as the user Postgres. It cannot create databases, but it can create roles, which means uh, this role can invite or create other user credentials to connect to the database, to create new accounts, so to say. Uh, inherit and no replication are two other uh, uh, options, which I do not want to explain. Connection limit means uh, negative one highs, uh, means that we do not limit uh, the number of connections to the database. And the password now is the default uh, password, just six times X. And you should, of course, change that in a, in a, in a real environment, in a, in, a, in, a, in a productive environment. And uh, so the, the comment for this role is the geo database master user. Then we create the database. Uh, and assign it to a geo master as the user, uh, as, as the owner. And uh, so the comment is geospatial database for training with post GIS and QGIS. Then this is this tiny little uh, command here means that within psql, the command line interface, we are changing now 
the database connection to Geo. And it's still the user Postgres which is executing the stuff, right? So now we are user, the user becomes Postgres and connects to the database Geo. And then as the data within the database Geo, it creates the schema DWD and the authorization is then GeoMaster. So the GeoMaster is, is a kind of owner of that, uh, that, that uh, schema. Good. And uh, so that is, uh, and the comment on the schema DWD is, it is, it's a kind of namespace, you can say, to store the DWD data or a folder, if you like. Looks like a folder. Okay, so let's execute the command, uh, the SQL statement. So therefore I open a terminal here. For now I'm using the Anaconda prompt, uh, but you could use also another command line interface. So, but I would prefer, I prefer uh, the Windows PowerShell. Okay, let me see. So when I do a directory listing, uh, I see this 010 create database geo create role and so on. And now let's execute this. P sequel minus uh, uppercase U, upper U, so user Postgres, minus D, lowercase D is the database that has the same name, but it's a completely different thing, right? The first Postgres is a user, the second Postgres is the name of a database. And the file we would like to execute, uh, that's 001, now I press tab and it does an automatic completion. And now it asks me for the password. Ah, okay. And you see uh, the role GeoMaster already existed, but anyway, uh, it would have created the GeoMaster if it had not existed before. Uh, so then the comment create database, and now you are connected to database Geo as user Postgres, and we are creating the schema DWD, and uh, we comment the schema. Okay, so how does that look like in pgadmin? So now we right click on databases and say refresh and suddenly you see a second database geo. Here I'm connected uh, in pgadmin, I'm connected as user Postgres. That means when I click here, I now connect as the user Postgres to the database geo. That's something you, which might be confusing, so you have to keep this in mind. Then you see here the drop down of the schemas, and within the schemas, there is now the DWD schema, and we don't have any views or tables yet, right? But everything is there. If I right click on Geo and ask for the properties, requ request the properties, you see that the owner is GeoMaster, and the comment is Geospatial Database for training with PostGIS and QGIS. That's exactly what we have written in the SQL statements and you see that this was successful. So we created the database. Good. And now we have to do the next step, right? It's a, it's a Postgres database and we have a user. And, but it is not yet a geospatial database. So we have to activate uh, the, we have to create the extension PostGIS within the database. So, and this is done by the other script here, the next one in the, in the line. It is called um, 12 create extension PostGIS. So, and that's very simple. Here again, you see how we should use it. So psql minus u PostgreSQL, but this time, the master user connects to the database geo and as the user geo we are executing this command uh, sorry as the user postgres in the database geo within the database geo we are now executing this command and create the extension postgis that's it 
So I can also do this manually. So I could pass this file again to the P uh, SQL command line interface, or I can just do it manually and let me do it interactively. So I call P SQL minus user post grass minus dash D database geo. So let's connect as Postgres to um, to Geo, and let's have a look at the relations. So that means with backslash D, uh, I can I can uh, kind of I can list all the views and tables, so all the relations which are in Geo, but there aren't any relations yet and uh, so let's create extension postgis but this requires that you have installed uh, the postgis software on the server already because otherwise it would not find this postgis package and it could not create the extension so now the extension was created so i uh, maybe I, I stay logged in here so what do we see now in uh, in pg admin so you see that now we have in the public schema at least one table a new table which is the spatial reference systems and uh, um, all rows okay now you see here the information on the spatial different spatial reference systems with from for example with the authority EPSG right the, so the definition for all the spatial reference systems and the ones we are using is so come often using is four three uh, two six. So let me select four three two six from it. Um, query tool here, of course. So select. all from uh, spatial reference systems where so the, what was the column name again the column name was the authority as writ spatial spatial reference ID is 4326 I think it's a number and not a string so let's see yeah Okay, so you see this is now EPSG4326 and it's uh, WGS84 and we have here some, uh, yeah, some further parameters uh, which projection, for example, projection parameters have to be used and so on. Okay, so that's, so, and, and this table would not be available uh, if you uh, do not execute this uh, create extension uh, post GIS. So that's that's a good indication that this worked. So let's close this again. Don't save. Don't save. Okay. Okay, but uh, now let's fill the DWD. Um, schema right and it, 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 it looks like it like it like a folder here right and uh, yeah a folder or a namespace but it's it's called a schema in the context of uh, databases re relational database management systems okay so now let's fill the t the, the information from dwd in in uh, here in this schema and create let's create tables right one for the station information so where are the station located and what is the name of the station? 
um, and uh, one table for the long, very long table for the time series. And that is expensive to fill in because it's a, it's a very long table with more than one million uh, rows. So that takes some time also uh, in uploading. So now let's fill it. So we use the this, uh, the Jupyter Notebook in uh, the activity Geo 930, insert time series into PostgreSQL and PostGIS and join it with the station info geodata. So here's some more explanation. You can read through it. Um, yeah. Uh, so maybe maybe I, I, I read I read it for you. So the main idea behind this activity is to reformat and merge time series data from the DWD. Right here with here we use hourly precipitation as well as weather station information from the DWD climate data center in such a way that it can be used with the QGIS time manager uh, extension. Um, but this time the join of the station in for geodata and the time series, so this is one table and that's another table, are performed in PostgreSQL PostGIS instead of pandas and CSV. So in an earlier activity, we, we, we did this join in, in a Python script and uh, stored or yeah, wrote this joint table to a CSV file, which we then imported uh, to, uh, to QGIS directly. But this time I want to use PostGIS to show the power and beauty of this system. So the time manager allows to filter an attribute table of a vector layer for example, points representing precipitation stations plus precipitation data with a timestamp column. So you have a long list of features. The extension limits the attribute table, so the, the time manager limits the attribute table um, to the records matching the particular timestamp provided by the time manager extension. So for example, by the user moving the time slider. This selected subset of the attribute table or feature table is then used to change the symbology of the vector layer according to the variable of interest, for example, the precipitation rate. <coughs> but we will see this later in QGIS. The relation created by joining the station info geodata with the time series is technically spoken a one-to-end relationship. So if you know about entity relationship management, uh, entity relationship modeling, you might be familiar with one-to-end relationship. So that means that one station has n measurement values. And they can be distinguished by timestamp. Uh, technically, the primary key for that relation consists of two attributes, namely the station ID and the timestamp. So finally, the data format is a concatenation of time series together with geographic location in 2D, for example, latitude and longitude. The required data format looks principally like this. So you see here the station ID, the name, the latitude and the longitude of uh, the stations. And here you see the measurement time at the precipitation rate. And what is missing here, so that, that information comes from the time series and that information here comes from uh, the station information. And you have to merge or join this information. And this is an example of a format um, of data which can be used in the time manager. Um, but you see here, we have now, a, so you see we have, first of all, the, the, the time series of station ID 1595. And um, you see we have here redundant information for the sta same station ID, the same name and latitude and longitude. And here the measurement time, which is increased by one hour. So daily, so hourly values and the precipitation rate. And then 
it, it, it is followed by more and more time series and in between you have the time series for the station uh, 13670 and in the same uh, in the same manner so all of that all of these time series are appended one after the other it's a sequence of time series in this long table with a lot of redundant information right because you just have to know once where the station id 1595 is located right but here you have to add this to all of these rows and in in, in qgis if you import this this kind of table this relation here then you would have several uh, features points right um, which are which share the same location but which have which are different in the precipitation rate and the measurement time of course which means if you had a time series with one with 1000 hours for example of 1000 hours length for this particular station you are creating 1000 points printed on top of each other which just differ in the precipitation rate for a given time so this is the idea behind it it's a yeah this this is the data format which is required by the time manager okay so and the idea of this activity now is to upload the station information with geopandas directly to the postgis database and to upload all the time series also to the postgis database to merge this information then and then to merge or join the information in the database such that we get a format which looks like this in the database already as a view a so-called view a selection with a join and this view is then exported to qgis and used in qgis okay so so i don't want to comment all of the parts um just just read through through the code um so the ftp connection this is uh, yeah the service open data dwd the user is anonymous uh, so we are using file transfer protocol uh, then we are creating so the topic directory we are interested in is uh, we want to read the hourly precipitation recent data set and uh, the station description pattern is uh, underscore beschreibung station and text that means this is the pattern of all the files in the archive here right so if i ask you uh, to name the um, the description the file providing the descriptions of the stations you would probably give me this name here and um, so underscore beschreibung underscore stationen uh, that's unique for all these or that's a unique pattern for all these descriptive files you have in this large data data archive of the DWD. So just search for Beschreibung Stationen, and uh, then it would give you in this case the hourly uh, rain rate, but it could also be the daily temperatures and so on, right? Or climate data, daily climate data, and so on. But all of these files would share Beschreibung Stationen. Good so then uh, we create local directories so i basically um, keep part of this directory structure i conserve part of this data, uh, directory structure and copy this uh, on my local file system so then let's create uh, the directories and uh, so the directories now are created here in the folder data and then we have original dwd hourly precipitation and recent right so and i will do the same uh, that's for the original and if we uh, generate data which is derived from uh, from this uh, directory branch here I would I would then use so from original DWD data if we derive anything from here I would store it in a similar directory tree but uh, rename original uh, with generated okay so then let's connect to the data to the to the archive 
So now we create a pandas data frame from the FTP directory listing. So that means what, what we see here is now, so this directory listing with all the file names now goes into a uh, pandas data frame and have a look at the at, at the software yourself so you can read oh. uh, so you, you you find this uh, the function which does the job in uh, my underscore dwd python script which is in the directory here in the folder so and now um, yeah so, so now we uh, download and process the station description file, which means here we are searching from this directory listing, we are searching for a file which uh, basically contains the pattern Beschreibung Station and text and the file name which has been matched is RR Stundenwerte Beschreibung Station and text. So that's the correct station description file. And then we simply grab this file and download it, right? So this is the FTP directory, the FTP source from the FTP archive, and the local destination is data original DWD hourly precipitation recent, and then RR Stundenwerte Beschreibung Station text. So we are conserving, we are basically copying the directory structure of the DWD data archive. So then we are renaming the column headers to English. So, and finally, our uh, imported stations data frame, the stations data frame looks like this. The station ID is the row identifier, the index of uh, that data frame, then date from, date to, nicely uh, formatted as real date formats in Python, the altitude, the latitude, the longitude, the name, and the federal state. So, and now we select only the stations which are in Nordrhein-Westfalen and are still operational. And we do this with uh, uh, binary masks, so logical masks. So here we are searching for, uh, yeah, DWD stations column state where the string contains Nordrhein. So we are searching for all the records where the state is something like Nordrhein. Uh, and that gives us a binary yeah, filter, binary array uh, index, basically a binary index. And it's operational. Uh, we are just searching for date two is the maximum date two, which is available, right? So you see the maximum date two, which you find in this data set is uh, the 11th of February, 2021. That's the maximum and now we are searching, we're just selecting uh, the rows where date two matches this maximum date, which means uh, we assume that this, this date, that these functions, uh, these stations are then still uh, operational. So, good. Okay. And uh, so it's, so we, we, so 81 rows are left over, which means we have 81 rows, eight, 81 stations in Northern Westfalen, which provide hourly precipitation information and in, in the recent data set and which are still active. So now this is a very nice feature. Uh, is this a, a, a GeoPandas uh, um, extension package? And the GeoPandas can operate on Pandas data frames, but it can enrich the, the pandas uh, um, capabilities by adding geometric info or geographic or geometric information to pandas data frames. So what is interesting here in fact is that you see we have here the latitude and longitude information. The latitude would become the y value and the longitude is the x value so that's the east uh, east-west direction uh, or west-east direction and the latitude is south-north direction. Um, so these, these are providing kind of x and y coordinates. Of course it's latitude and longitude is not a, not a uh, Cartesian coordinate system but anyway. Um, 
so and we are creating now points uh, for x and y in zip longitude and la la latitude so we are combining now longitude and latitude side by side and uh, and we are creating now points for uh, so I, I, we are using longitude and latitude for each station and from this information we are creating a new geom geometry you can say we are creating an object of type point so this is just a number right but this now becomes an object and we can handle it as an object of type point then we have to give the coordinate reference system epsg 4326 and now this is this now makes this geodata frame now creates a geodata frame from the old data frame with the stations um, and it adds a new column uh, with all the geometry with all the point information the geometric point information for each station and if you look at the um, at the structure at this uh, at this new data frame you see now that we have a new column added to it and that's the geometry and uh, it's a complex data type of type point so this is just a print out so that we can see uh, there is a, a point information encoded here in this geometry column for this particular station so basically we would not need latitude and longitude columns anymore but I find it convenient to keep it, right? Because everything is now already here in the geometry and PostGIS as well as QGIS would operate on this geometry type and not on latitude and longitude anymore. Okay, so now we have this data frame of the stations together with the geometry of the point coordinates of each feature. And now we connect to the PostGIS database and we are using a bunch of um, um, of, of uh, packages, Python packages to do so. So, but first of all, um, we define yeah, the dictionary of the connection parameters, uh, user, password, host, and DB. So GeoMaster is clear, the password we, we have given in the SQL statement when we created the GeoMaster. As I said, you should change it, of course. The host is the local host. If you had a remote database, you can simply give here the name of the remote server and the database is geo. And um, that's the template for generating the connection string. And we fill in, so we are printing, basically we are formatting. Yeah, by using this format, we are filling in these placeholders with the values from the dictionary and then you get a very nice very nice connection string a connection url that's the that's the content of the string postgres colon slash slash geomaster is the name of uh, the database user the password at the um, database server localhost the the uh, port number uh, that's the default port number 4532 for postgis postgresql and the database is geo and this connection string is then used to connect to the database. And we do this by means of the SQL Alchemy uh, package. Good. So we have the connection string. And um, so what we do now here is we are creating a database engine with the connection URL, which is this connection string here. right? So we are passing this connection identifier to the function create engine and um, good and 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 then we just use this stations geodata frame which is now a geo pandas geodata frame uh, that that provides a method to post gis which means what is in the data frame can be written immediately to a post gis database and what we do here is we want to store the information of the stations underscore gdf so this uh, geodata frame 
in the PostGIS database, in the table stations, we want to create a table named stations in the schema DWD. If it, or, if it already exists, then replace it. That means delete the old content and create it newly. The index, um, the unique identifier for this table will become the station ID column of the data frame. So yeah, we want to, we set this index label to true. The connection is the engine, the connection engine, the database engine we have defined before, right? Because we have to tell the system in which database this is to be connected. And then we add additional information about the data types. And that can be very interesting or sometimes important because it is not always, you cannot always rely on an automatic translation of a Python data type to a PostgreSQL SQL data type. Sometimes um, the choices which are made are not optimal. Therefore, I, I do a data type translation explicitly. Right? For example, I say that the station ID should be stored in the data type numeric six. So it's an, it's an integer data type just with six digits. The altitude is a real number with a floating point. Date from is a date, date two is a date, and the longitude and the latitude are also real numbers, right? So I don't rely on any automatic type casting. And um, yeah, and then uh, so and, and and this creates the table in uh, in PostGIS, and uh, then uh, I I also create a, a new primary key for the station explicitly. So alter table DWD dot stations. You see. So now if we refer to the table, we also we always always have to give the uh, the schema schema dot table name add primary key station ID so and if I execute this that's done right so that just takes a second and now you have a new table refresh and this table is the t is the stations table and let's select all rows and here now you see nicely the station ID, date from, date to, and so on, altitude, latitude, longitude, name, and the state. Uh, it's still not on Westfalen, and you can even view the geometries in this column, which is, yeah, you can see, so PostGIS post basically provides already a quick view, and you see this looks good, right? So this is the, the, the distribution of precipitation stations um, in, yeah, basically within the limits in the borders of Northern Westfalen. And maybe you can see here this, uh, this thin gray line or brownish line that is the border of the federal state of Northern Westfalen. And that's just a quick view um, in the database, right? So that works pretty nicely. Okay, so that, that worked. That has been successful. And you see how easy this is, right? If you have a pandas data frame with some geometric information, somehow in this data frame, you can create a decent, let's say, point geometry, add the column with all the ge geometric information to the features you have in your data frame, and then you simply say, store it to PostGIS. Right? Insert it or create it, create the table in PostGIS. It's very simple. Okay, so that's half of the game. And now the expensive part starts because the data here is that it's, there is not much data, right? It, it, it's just 81 or 80 sta stations we have. So, but now we have to download and process the time series zip archives. And you've seen the long lists of uh, the zips. And we have to download the right ones for the stations which are selected in Nordrhein-Westfalen and which are still active. 
and uh, download them and open them extract uh, so open open the archive extract the, the product text file from it within the product text file we have to extract the column with the precipitation and then we have to upload this automatically uh, into the Postgres database right okay so I think I have to reconnect uh, because we after such a long time I usually run into a um, connection timeout so then let's go back to the place where we download and process the time series zip okay so select all the zips from the directory listing we had before and now download download the zip archives 81 or how many uh, from for the stations which we selected here you see the, the station numbers uh, from the archive that's all and now uh, let's operate on the zip files and um, yeah so yeah i can yeah so in this cell here code cell i'm uh, i'm still creating a local copy of um, um uh, yeah the the uh, the time series uh, table but it's basically not really necessary it produces if you execute this it will produce a text file of around 110 megabytes size with just three columns um, station id timestamp and um, measurement value so that can be done but i would like to go on uh, I would like to go on uh, with this uh, code here which um, inserts the data immediately to uh, the post, uh, GraphQL, post GraphQL database and um, you see this is this is now in the end the table will look like will look like this so we have a measurement date here the station ID and uh, the precipitation rate um, so that's the format which you would get if you don't if you extracted the the time series from the product uh, file in the in the zip archive. So anyway, um, so what I am doing here is that I'm uh, we are here looping, iterating through uh, the 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 list of the zip files which we downloaded each so then we take one of the zip files and we exec we uh, extract the product file name the product file from the zip file and from this product file we are extracting the time series right and then you get a date then we are creating a data frame for each station time series which looks like this and then we use the pandas data frame function to sql to store the data automatically in the database and um, so this is now done step by step so if if uh, we read the first time series from a zip then we replace any existing precipitation um, table in the sql in the in the postgresql database right so again we the the, the table we will create uh, is named prec for precipitation in the schema dwd if exists replace the index will be the time series uh, sorry the timestamp ts that's a column and uh, so then some other parameters again the explicit uh, data type casting uh, the connection which is the database connection and so on so that's for the first time we are replacing 
and for it, for all other um, um, time series we are uploading, we will append the time series and not replace the table. So this is expensive and it takes quite some time, but uh, let me execute this anyway. So that takes a few minutes now and um, I have to, so let's wait. Okay, so after a few minutes, um, the upload uh, is complete. And um, after having created uh, the dwd.prec precipitation table, uh, we create an index to uniquely identify or to, de to, de yeah, to de determine the unique identifiers for that table. So let's have a look at the table in pgadmin. So again, schema dwd and tables refresh. Now we have two tables, precipitation and station. So let's have a look at the properties of the precipitation table. It belongs to GeoMaster, it's in the schema DWD, and the columns are now the timestamp with time zone, the station ID numeric 6, and the value is a real value. Okay, so now let's analyze this a bit. Um, first of all, I would like to know how many rows this table have. So select star or asterisk, so all, basically select all from dwd.precipitation, press F5. And uh, so I don't see the output here for some reason. Maybe I have to reopen this query editor. No, I don't want to, s don't save it. Again, go to the query tool. Something went wrong while loading the panel. File reset layout. Okay. File reset layout. Yes, I want to reset the layout. 
changes you made may not be, that's okay. Okay, oh, that really starts from the very beginning. Okay, anyway. Oh. So again, <laughs> precipitation query tool. Good. Select all from DWD precipitation, press F5. So, and you see it takes 0.8 seconds to select 1 million rows. And of course, it doesn't make sense to really go through the rows here, right? It's, it's, a, it's an extremely long table, so it, th this view is useless. Um, so, but we can count, select count from the station. So, so count all fields from DWD precipitation, first of all. Uh, it takes us 0.17 seconds uh, to count 1 million rows. And now let's check whether how much values we have per station ID. So select station ID and count from DWD precipitation group by station ID. So we are grouping uh, we are grouping the the whole data by station ID first and within a unique station ID data set we count a five okay and here's the result so you see for a station 216 we have 13,122 hourly measurements, whereas for the station 603, we just have about 4,500 hourly measurements. And you see here some inconsistencies, right? That would be interesting to analyze. Where does this come from? Of course, sometimes you have measurement devices, right, which might fail for a short time, or, or there might be another reason for it, right? But um, if you really need all the data, without any gaps, then you have to analyze this further and see where these gaps are really come from. And then you have to find out how to intelligently fill the gaps. But often it's, it's advisable to deal with no data so that if you have data gaps, uh, do the analysis, including the data gaps, right, which means you are not filling them with some some guesses you make or for some crazy estimates, you're, you're just telling the truth and say, okay, this data is missing. I don't know exactly what's going on there, but sometimes you have to fill it. Anyway, there are methods to do that. And you see there are some inconsistencies. We have 81 stations and uh, yeah, <laughs> interestingly, most, so we, we have almost always, let's, let's sort them, right? Sort by, order by and let's rename the count count as CNT so I give it a new name this column here order by CNT descending F5 so now it's called count and you see most of the stations have 13,200 hourly values which is to be expected that's and here you see a few have one less and two or three less and here even so and then here are just 12,000 around 12,000 and this is really bad so 603 of course needs some investigation there is something really wrong that's really un unexpected where do these 4,000 come from instead of um, 12,000 or 13,000 even good anyway so this is first um, first analysis so and now we have this the precipitation information at the station information, right? And now we can create a view uh, and merge this information because in the end we want to we want to join both information, right? And I would like to show you interactively how we can do this. Um, let me start here so I still have my query editor. So select, let's say the station ID. 
for I rename the table I'm selecting from. Select T1 station ID from the table DWD dot stations and I use an alias for this table and I'm renaming it to T1. So here I get now the station ID. Okay, I, I want the station ID and the name. And pff, the altitude is not really interesting. The station ID, the name is okay. Okay, let's execute. So you see now the names of the, of the stations of that particular we don't need the state because that's trivial anyway. We just have the not on Westfalen stations here. Um, and let's say t1.geometry. That's the new column which was created by Geopandas, right? And that contains the, geome the geometry information. And again, I can click here and I see here, ooh, these are the stations in not on Westfalen. Um, so that has been created by Geopandas, right? So now I want to merge this information, join this information with data from the precipitation table, which I, because I'm so lazy, I, I'm, I'm locally renaming it to T2, temporarily rename it to T2, so that I can, uh, that I do not have to type so much. T2 dot timestamp and T2 dot value, right? And, but there is still no relationship between these two tables, right? And now we can add a condition and the condition is where the station ID from table one matches the station ID from table two. Uh, DWD, so here I forgot the schema. So now, now we are merging that information, right? So we have station ID, the name, the geometry, the timestamp, and the value. Okay, so that is the information we would need in the time manager and QGIS, right? So we have now maybe re let's let's re reorder the columns. So I take the station ID first, and then I the second column should be the timestamp, and then the value, and then the name and the geometry of the station. Okay. Station ID, so you see station 216 and the timestamp starting from the 11th of August 2019 at 2 o'clock plus 2 means Central European time, that's our German time and uh, so it has a timestamp and you should always use uh, timestamps with time zone, right? Very important. Uh, so, and then we have the values here, which are the precipitation values. And that has about, I think, 8,000 or so, no, 13,000 values. We've counted them before, do you remember? And after 13,000 hourly values for that station, we would get the next timestamp for the next station. <laughs> I just want to see the, the jump in the data. Ah. ah, here, 216, right? Still 216. And here is the jump. That's interesting. That has, to, that has no, it's okay. We expected 13,200. So 78 values are missing for the first uh, station here. 
and then after 13,122 rows in the table, the next time series begins for the next station named Berleburg. So the first station here is Attendorn, Neulisternol, which with station ID 216, and then uh, we go over to Berleburg, but Arfeld with station ID 389, and so on, right? And this is how you, in the end, achieve more than one million rows in that table. And um, such a table is very difficult to handle in a in a in a in a spreadsheet program. You can imagine, right? And and it's also not so easy to import that information immediately to uh, to QGIS, right? So one method would be to 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 store this information to to join that to join these two information layers. Right, the stations and the time series in Python in Pandas and to export it to a file. This, as I said, the CSV file has approximately 110 megabytes with 1 million rows in that file. And um, yeah, and that's uh, very hard for QGIS to, di to digest this, this, this large, uh, this large uh, table. And um, I, I, I think it's, it's more, yeah, it has, it, to use QGIS shows in the end a higher performance. But so that, this information now has to be conserved, right? We, we need this view, it's, that's a, a selection, right? But we can create a view based on the selection, which is a kind of virtual table. When you select from the view, it will, join the information from the underlying tables in real time while you are executing this, this select statement. So therefore, let's create a view. Create a view and we call this now v underscore stations uh, underscore time series basically and precipitation let's say stations and precipitation as and now in parenthesis select <laughs> let's see if that works execute so so 0.2 seconds and now we have a view in the schema dwd I thought. <laughs> oh yeah, that's in the public schema. So I forgot to name uh, to to name the schema, which means we created it in the wrong place here. So let's drop this view. Okay, and let's create the view DWDV stations press view stations precipitation uh, in the schema dwd. So let's have a look at the view, list of views, and the stations. Here it is. Okay. And the nice thing about that is it looks like a table, but it's a kind of, yeah, temporary table or uh, live table li with live data. So the, 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 the view is created while you are accessing it or the, the, the content of the view. So all rows. So the first execution takes one second, 1.7 second, but the next time, so let's close it. It's also cached, I think. Don't save. So if I open that again, view edit data, all rows. Ah, it still takes some time here. 1.6 seconds. Whoa, that's long. But we have this, the stations. The station ID here is the primary key. The station ID is the primary key of the unique data set identifier in the table stations. And in the precipitation table, 
it should be timestamp and station ID exactly but that's okay and that's also a constraint here precipitation uh, primary key T station and station ID okay that would be the unique identifier right from from the station uh, sorry from the precipitation uh, table you could identify each each row uniquely by using uh, the timestamp and the station ID okay good so now we have the view and this view now can be used in QGIS so how do we how do we do that so let's open QGIS I open a new project and first of all I will add some information in the background uh, which is the the boundary of the federal state of northern Westfalen so you could you can download this from the data set uh, Deutsche Verwaltungsgrenzen DVG 1 or 2 DVG DVG 1 or DVG 2 uh, the difference is just the spatial resolution so DVG 1 has a higher spatial resolution so I will use DV, uh, DVG 1 so you will find this in the open data archive of the federal state of Northern Westfalen so it's the data set Deutsche Verwaltungsgrenzen DVG right but luckily or that's really uh, nice uh, the federal state also provides um, the data as a uh, web feature service so i will connect so I, I described this in another video how to use how to fill in the data sources uh, for the um, open data web services right um, so and here I filled in the information for the open data of the federal state of Northern Westfalen and I'm now connecting to Northern Westfalen NW topographische Sonderkarten and Verwaltungsgrenzen so Verwaltungsgrenzen is administrative boundaries connect and then you get DVG1 and DVG2 data sets and I use this Landesgrenze NRW which is the boundary of uh, Northern Westfalen and add it to my project. So this, this is now live and it's a bit distorted because the default EPSG is still 4326 but I changed this now to a projected uh, universal transverse Mercator projection 32 North which is the official projected uh, which is the official projected database uh, the uh, EPSG in uh, for the federal state of Northern Westfalen let me switch off the video here so then you can see uh, the EPSG 25832 is now my projected coordinate reference system okay so let's change the color a bit Oop, I don't know maybe gray okay good and now let's add the post GIS layer layer add layer add post GIS layer now you have to define a connection for the database first mm, I already have it defined maybe I show this again um, so maybe I even remove this connection. Remove. Are you want geoconnection or associated settings? Yes. Okay. New connection. The name is the name I give it locally in uh, in QGIS, but it should definitely be the name of the database, right? That makes sense. So database is geo. The name of this connection should also be geo. It's you can also call it geo connection or something service is not needed and the host is localhost okay the SSL mode secure socket layer it's in, it's about encryption so I prefer this SSL mode and um, I we also have to 
look at tables, also list tables with no geometry. That can that can be useful later on. Um, so, but the view we are importing has a geometry, right? It has a column geometry which comes from the stations uh, table with the geometry column. Okay, and the authentication here. So the username is geo underscore master. And I store the name of the user, but I do not store the password. I want to be asked every time I'm connecting to the database. Okay, so name is geo, host, localhost, port 5432. Database is geo, username geo master. Okay, so now it asks me for the password. So the our uh, the playground password here is uh, six times x. And uh, now let's connect. Tada! And now you see the different schema, schemata, dwd, and we have two information here, but unfortunately for some reason I cannot see the view. But anyway, let's for let's and I don't know why, but let's go for the DWD stations first. And let's add this layer because that already provides the station information, right? And uh, it has a full it has a full attribute table, of course. And now you can change attributes here and the attributes you are changing here will then automatically be reflected also in, um, in the PostGIS database. Let's take for example um, this station here. So what is it? So that's the station in Xanten, name Xanten. And so let's change the attributes of that table Xanten, or this, this, uh, this feature Xanten. But first, let's have a look at uh, the database here. Let's go to tables, select from the tables, query tools, So open query tools and um, select all from stations where name like single quotation mark Xanten or yeah, X and the wildcard is a percent from DWD stations. Again. Okay, and here we have it. The station number is 5733. It provides data since 2005. It's still active, 20 meters above ground, above uh, sea level, and uh, here we have the name Xanten. Okay, so let's change the attribute here. I toggle the edit mode here, toggle editing, so I click here on this pen and now the editing is active. I click here on the eye and there is also a possibility to say, so I can change the attribute either in the attribute table, so I could go to the attribute table and change the information there, or I say auto open form, right, and I click and I click here it opens a form and then I can change the name to Xanten is cool. It's Roman, right? So it's a Roman uh, settlement. Uh, or at least yeah, it's in the direct neighborhood of uh, Colonia Olpia Traiana, which is, was a, a Roman colonia. Okay, and if I 
to toggle, if I switched uh, editing off, it will update this information. And of course, this will also be done here. So let me refresh it. And you see now that this is also Xanten is cool, it's Roman, is also reflected here in the database. And vice versa, of course, right? Which means I don't know if that's editable here. So let's revert it. Xanten is cool. Okay. Uh, I think I have to commit my changes in the data set. And if I now select here the information, it's reverted to Xanten, right? So you see it's really a live link between the data in QGIS and the data in PostGIS. So it, I, I find this really fantastic. So you can even delete here part of the stations, create them newly, in the recreate them in the database, and then they will be reflected automatically here. So that's really very, very handy and useful. Okay, so still I have a problem with the view. The view is for some reason not visible. Let me save this uh, first of all. Um, <coughs> Speichern. Okay, and let's go back to the database connection. DB Manager, PostGIS, Geo. DWD, ah, here, here it is. Ah, this user has no privileges. Ah, yes, now I see what the problem is. Um, I created this view as user Postgres, um, but I did not, the user Postgres did not grant select on his view to GeoMaster. So I should create the view as user GeoMaster. So, and I prepared a script to do that or for the command line. So let me drop this view first. So I'm still connected here to Geo. And I drop the view, uh, but it is in use. It might be that I cannot, um, that I cannot drop it. Ah, DWD. Oh, okay. It wasn't in use, right? The station file was in use, but not the station table was in use, but not the, um, not this view. I would have liked to use it, but I, the the user GeoMaster was not allowed to use this view, which was created by PostgreSQL by Postgres by the user Postgres. I could have changed that by granting access or granting select to the user, but I think it's cleaner if uh, the user GeoMaster creates that, uh, that view. Okay, so let me just copy, oh no, I deleted it already, but I think I have a history here. No. Is this here manage macros? No. There is a history somewhere. Explain, analyze. I don't know where, how to show the history of my commands. Anyway, so I create, let me see, but query, ah, here, query history, here it is. Okay, that is easy. Update, commit, select, select. How can I? Uh, I cannot enlarge the size of this. Uh, uh, select. 
a name like Sunton. Create view here. It is copy, copy to query editor. Okay, so I uh, simply create a new SQL script. And save it here because I created the database and I created the extension, but I did not create, I don't have a script here which creates the view. So that means let me create the view. And the view's name is v underscore stations underscore precipitation. Okay, save. And how do I want to execute this script? I connect as user GeoMaster to the new database Geo and create the view which joins station stations and so the geo information of stations and the precipitation time series. Okay. So the name of that file now is this 14. Geomaster minus D geo minus F and this is now the new SQL script, create view v stations precipitation 01. So version basically this is the version of the file. So create view dwd, that's what we've done before. Dwd v stations I select u1 stations and so on. Where t1 stations. Okay, that should that should work. So that means we just have to execute the script in the right directory with that file. And one, two, three, four, five, six times x. And the view is created. Good. Let's have a look at, uh, let's check it in properties here. Uh, refresh. Refresh everything. Refresh the views. V station. Okay. Properties. Now the owner's geomass. I could have changed it to owner probably here as well. <laughs> Okay, anyway, so now, now you've seen how I did that in, uh, in so I created the view in uh, PG Admin and how I created the view by the means of a SQL script and psql. Good, so now it should be visible and usable in QGIS. So, layer. Let's add a post GIS layer. Connect to the database DWD, and here the new view shows up, but with an exclamation mark. And the problem is that the view cannot explain to QGIS which attributes have to be used to uniquely identify each feature, right? So if you look at the table, let me go back to PG up. Uh, let's go back here and select all rows, for example. Um, then you see QGIS cannot know which combination of attributes here to use to uniquely identify each row. So what's the primary key of a view? The view itself doesn't have a primary key. It's based on primary keys which are 
yeah, primary keys of the underlying table, but it's not inherited, so to say, and it's not uh, uh, transferred, this information is not transferred to uh, QGIS. So therefore, we have to to change this feature identifier. So click on this field and then a, a drop down menu occurs. And um, the feature identifier is the combination of station ID and time series, right? Because that identifies one row in this long table. So now we can add this information, close. But you see here the progress bar and <laughs> now you see slowly how the the features are popping up right it's as as it is now importing the information or retrieving the information querying the information from the qgs database as it comes in here uh, this 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 map is populated with green points right or yellow points so don't open the attribute table immediately because uh, that has more than 1 million rows and that is a burden to QGIS. So, and of course it doesn't make much sense to produce a video which is 500 days long with 24 um, hourly measurement values per day for 90 or for 80 stations, right? So let's change the import to a certain time span. And let's say, okay, we don't want to import the whole view. We just want to import um, the data for June, for example, in 2020. So right click on view stations precipitation layer and update the SQL layer. Then the DB manager comes up. And within the select statement now, we can narrow down the data we would like to import. So select all from DWDV stations precipitation, right? And now we add a condition where the timestamp is greater or equal 2000, so now in single quotes, 2020, let's say June. Maybe I have to provide a time time here as well. I don't know yet. And TS is less than 2020-07-01, right? So earlier than any July or earlier than the 1st of July and later or equal to any June date. So let's see if that works. Execute. Ah, okay, that works already. So it selects now approximately 57, 57,000 rows instead of 1 million rows. So in the selection, you see this uh, execution here took 0.25 seconds or so, a quarter of a second to narrow the data from 1 million data sets down to 50,000 data sets, right? And now let's update that information uh, in, in the imported layer. And you see that now the, uh, the now you can also open uh, the attribute table, which is which now has uh, 50,000 um, features, 50, 57,000 features right so that that's a size QGIS can handle still quite well and to be honest I don't know really the limits and um, you know now we cut we cut really all the all the time uh, the timestamps to June right you see now for for the station 216 this is the first of June and then it goes on until whatever so we have um, how many approximately 30 days times uh, 200 and uh, but times 25 values per a day so that is around so let's go down here still to 16 
So it's in the what was it? Ah, oh, here somewhere. Three eighty nine station three eighty nine. I see it such a such a long long table cannot really be browsed. It doesn't make much sense. Ah, here, <laughs> I missed it. I missed the jump here. Four hundred. Yeah, okay, of course, seven hundred and twenty values. Good, seven hundred and twenty hourly values for the station two hundred and sixteen in June. So 24 times uh, 300, uh, uh, no, sorry, 24 times 30 days. Uh, and then the next station follows, right? And, and now we have basically 721 uh, or 720 features printed on top of each other when we select the station 216. So at the same location here. So this. Each of this point in the map is not just a point, it's 720 points stacked, so printed on top of each other. So, and that's now where the time manager comes into play. And um, so you can install the time manager and use it here, toggle the visibility. And um, what I also suggest to do always is to change the view of the panel of the log messages, because this gives you valuable information whenever something went, goes wrong, either with a time manager or when you are importing from the database and so on. So that is extremely helpful. So processing messages, PostGIS itself, so you have all kinds of general messages, right? Plugins, um, Python warnings, and so on and so on. So this is highly recommended to have a look at the log uh, messages from time to time. So to narrow down any problems. And here now we have the, uh, the time manager. So here already we have a critical error, which I don't know, but uh, fall back to English. So there was no translation file. But that's okay. So the language, there was no language given, so was not loaded properly. So it falls back to English. So the time plug, time manager plugin now operates in English. But I'm fine with that, of course. Okay. So uh, first of all, I would like to unselect this point here. It's still active. Cancel. Oh no, it's missing, right? No. Yes, it is missing. You see, that's interesting. You see, this this point here does not provide precipitation information in June 2020 because that, that's in the stations list, but it's not in the time series list. And the only explanation is that is that the time series is not available for the selected time span. <laughs> That's interesting, you see? And that helps you really to identify, uh, let's say, inconsistencies and maybe errors in the data set, right? So That's, uh, that, then th this is definitely something you should, you should uh, keep an eye on, right? And, 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 and use this in your analysis as well in case you're doing a uh, real analysis of something. Um, so now let's activate the time manager and the layer we are adding to the time manager is the layers V stations precipitation. The start time is the TS, which is the timestamp, right? And the end time is also TS. It's also given in the start time column. So we don't use that. That's fine. And um, the time display option, the font size. So here I would like to show the time as year, month, day, and hours. 
And sometimes there are rounding errors in minutes and seconds. That's a bit annoying, a bit ugly. So I override this by saying, I just want to go for hours and then add zero, zero for, uh, for uh, minutes and seconds. But this is just for the display of time. And maybe we have to, that's southeast. Maybe let's move this to northwest, the old upper left corner. Okay, maybe we have to change the font size later a bit. Okay, so no, that's fine, that's good enough, right? And you see now, that's the first timestamp, 1st of June 2020. And this time now here, this, t this time frame identifier has been generated. That's the minimum time from the layer. And uh, so now when we when we when we start this time manager it will increment the time frame and whatever this time frame matches features in this layer here it will filter them and uh, so we have hourly resolution therefore let's take the time frame size of one hour and now if we look let's have a look at the attribute table right and we still have ah no it's already switched on so we just have 80 now uh, 80 features in the attribute table and all these features have the timestamp of the 1st of june 2020 this is what the time manager does right it, it selects from all the features only those which match the timestamp given here. When we switch the time manager off, so this with this button you can switch it on and off. This is now off again, so the, 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 the time printout here is vanishing. And we go back to the attribute table. You see that we now have access to the full attribute table of the 57,000 rows. And um, okay, so that works. So let's se let's select another time. So when we now, you see it's incrementing now automatically the time by one hour. And how fast this is done can also be can also be determined in the settings, but you can also select here times with your slider. And here, for example, you see the rounding errors. That's what I mean, right? Here it says 12 o'clock, 24 minutes and 17 seconds, right? Or here 13, 28, uh, 58. So let's see which time is selected from the attribute table. So it should be the 18th of June 2020 and something about uh, 1 o'clock. Attribute table, ah, oh, yeah, okay, it rounds it to 14 plus 2, okay, so that is 14 o'clock in Central European time, plus 2 means 2 hours um, later than Greenwich Mean Time, yeah. Okay, so anyways, this is, this is how the time manager works, and of course, uh, now the information we are we are plotting here is not is not really useful, right? Because we are not plotting any time variant information. We are just plotting this, the position of the stations. And um, so let's change uh, the symbol, right? And we use now a um, graduated colors based on the value of the precipitation. The symbol we are using, uh, so it should be a bit larger definitely, so maybe let's go to, maybe I use a blue dot first of all, for size is four, but the, the color will be overridden anyway. Okay, and now uh, let's change the color ramp and let's class classify first of all. And uh, so what you should take into what you what you should definitely uh, take into account. So you see the, the 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 time manager is still active, 
So, and for the current timestamp, the maximum precipitation on the map would be 0.2, right? This would lead to a completely uh, wrong scale, scaling for the whole, um, uh, for the whole time, uh, for the whole uh, precipitation values, right? And so let's, accept it for now. You see here we have a few stations with some precipitation, but when we switch off the time manager, then the, then the full um, the full attributable is, uh, is available and visible, right? And if we now say classify here, you see it goes up to 37, 36.7 millimeters per a um, uh, per, per hour. Uh, and here let's change the mode not to equal count but to equal interval. Um, good, but um, you see usually we have very small um, precipitation values um, around 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.5 millimeters or so. Therefore I would like to adjust uh, this color table manually but maybe we, we, we change the color ramp first. And so let's have a look at all color ramps in a nicer one, which is maybe more representative. Which one? Yellow to, what do we have? Yellow to orange or yellow to blue or green to blue maybe. Which green is it? Oh, that's yeah, pretty, oh, that's okay. So green to blue. And now I classify them manually. So I say, okay, this this symbol should be plotted. Only this color should be plotted for very low uh, precipitation intensities uh, below 0 0.01 millimeter, right? And this now uh, should then be used for precipitations up to 0 0.1 and then 0 0.2. So from 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 and from 0. 2 to 0.5, oops, 0.5, and then here from 0.5 to 1. And now I use a kind of logarithmic scale, so from 1 to 2, from 2 to 5, and from 5 to 10 and from 10 to 20 and from 20 to yeah whatever 50 right but it's uh, 30 30 something right 36 37 apply okay good so now let's see if we can identify some interesting interesting rain events here somewhere. Okay, here you see some higher rain intensities here in the eastern part of the federal state. Oh, here, that's a nice event. So let's see how that emerges. Yeah, beautiful, right? So you can slow this animation down by setting the, the delay here. You can, you can change the delay to slow this down. And each of these maps, so what you to, to create a video, what you have to do is for each of the time frames you are producing a map like this one here, but you can even you know, pimp the map a bit, right, and add some decorations to it. And then export the video, so save the files. Each each of the map will then generate a PNG file which you store on the on the hard drive. And then you can use an external software to to combine this to an MPEG. Uh, video stream mp4 or something right and then you would have a video um, for this particular month good so and if you if you decide to use another month let's say you don't want to use this uh, the, the june but let's say august or so the only thing you have to do is to change the filter in the in the in the sql import statement right let's say you want to go for august you say, okay, I want to take all values which are greater or equal August and less than uh, no, uh, September. Execute, 59,000, update, and that's it. 
So then we have to move the slider, I think, from minimum to maximum. Is that true? No. So I don't know how this, uh, how this information is now updated here in the time manager. <laughs> Let's have a look at the attribute table. Oh, that's interesting. Ah, oh, yeah, of course, the time doesn't match here. Okay, so let's go uh, to the attribute table without the time manager. The time manager is switched off. You see here we have now the the August, all the values for August. But here the time frame start and end is wrong. And. Uh, Can I? But I cannot change that manually. Hmm, this is a bit buggy, I would say, or maybe it's a feature. <laughs> um, so you have to find a way to update the time information here in the time manager setting. So the I think one way, of course, would be to um, to, to remove this layer and to add the layer again. Yeah. So, okay, let's remove the layer, but this is a bit annoying. So I think there is a better way, but I don't know which one it is. Add layer, stations, and so on, off seven seconds, no interpolation, faster, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Time display option is okay, okay. But it still stays here. Ook. Remove layer. I think I made a mistake in the in the time. So let me remove the layer. Add layer. Ah, here. Okay, I I chose the wrong. Um, the wrong layer first of all, <laughs> and the long uh, the wrong uh, timestamp here. So V stations precipitation start time in the timestamp. The end time is the same as the start time. So the column. Where you find the start time and the end time. Okay. And switch on. Aha, uh -huh. now it changed to August, right? That that's a bit that, that that's a bit clumsy, but I think there is a smarter way. Uh, maybe you Google it and, and find a solution here. But you see there is not much not much going on here in August, so it must have been pretty dry. Okay. So what have we achieved so far? Let's go back to the presentation. So, we created the PostGIS database Geo with Owner GeoMaster. We inserted the DWD station info via GeoPandas into the database. We inserted the DWD time series via pandas into the database directly and we created a view to join the station info with location, with the geometry column and the time series. And then we use this view in QGIS to feed the time manager. So yeah, that's what we have achieved. And um, I hope you you see the beauty of this approach because uh, you, you see the DWD is continuously measuring, right? And now you could simply add new, the newest value to the database, right? You could just select or download or try to extract somehow the latest information from the hourly values you have, right? And add them to the database, right? That you just, that you do not fill everything again but just the missing values since the last update, right? Let's say you, you try to, 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 to download, I don't know, once a day or so, the, the hourly measurement values from the precipitation, and then you just have to do an incremental insert into the database. 
And if the primary key in the table you would like to upload the data to is activated, it, the upload would reject duplicates. That means if a data set, a row in the table, is already existing and you want to upload it again, you would violate the unique constraint in the primary key because you would have two data sets with the same combination of the primary key and that's not allowed because the primary key has to be unique. Then automatically the system would reject the insert, the insertion. So and then you can automatically let this database grow in the background and you just have to open your, your QGIS project and you would automatically get the updated information whenever you are connecting to the database again, right? So, um, and the performance is really fast and you, you, you can handle the, the data easily, right? You can select and cut the data into chunks, right? You say, okay, I just want to get I just want to use the stations which are above 400 meters. I just want to use the stations which are in Bavaria. I just want to use stations which have been active in 2017. I just want to use time series from the 15th of May 2018 until the 13th of September 2019 or something, right? So you are super flexible in, in, in really cutting the data into chunks you would like to analyze, investigate. And uh, yeah, the, the time manager is basically one method to, to combine yeah, spatial information, geospatial information with temporal information. So it's a geospatial temporal database, you can say. Okay, I hope you had fun. See you. Bye-bye.